saw me in a movie and I was a little girl, but now I'm an old bat. <laughs> and I probably look about like Methuselah, Methuselah, oh yes, I have to put an A on it because Methuselah was a man and I am a girl. And, uh, yeah, I'm a girl. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I thought that I would sing a song for you that my mother used to sing to me. And then you can see whether I can sing or not and whether you like me or not, okay? that song. Yes. <laughs> he told me he was going to cry. Only a little. Only a little. Oh. <laughs> so what do you want to, should, what should we do? Should we tell him how I started work? Yes. Well, uh, when I was six months old, my mother took me down to Central Casting. And I had pictures. And in Central Casting, you uh, then are liable to be called to go to a studio for an interview. And at that time they had what were called cattle calls. Now a cattle call is when a studio wants, say, a, a year old child or a two year old baby. And then they uh, call up everybody who has a year old or two year old child. And everybody in Hollywood who has one goes there and there might be 50, 75, 85, <coughs> horrible little brats going for the job. And that's called a cattle call. And then eventually I got a job in our gang. There was an ad in the uh, Citizen, Hollywood Citizen News, uh, Hal Roach wanted to get new kids in our gang. And so he had a tent in Palms and it was all set up with all these horrible little children and their horrible little parents and they were spit cleaning them. You know, the handkerchief bit cleaning them, combing them, and the little monsters are singing and dancing and doing all sorts of things that Al Roach didn't want. And my mother uh, took me over there and I was dressed in a black velvet dress. I'm, I'm three years and 10 months old. 
I'm dressed in a black velvet dress with a lace collar, and I have lace socks on. I have a bonnet, black velvet bonnet, with ostrich feathers on it, white, <laughs> and white kid gloves. Now, of course, all of you dress your children like that in their three years and 10 months old. And uh, Mama bulldozed her way right up to the stage in this tent and puts me up on stage. And uh, they start taking uh, the film, and I start crying. Why? I have no idea. And anyway, I, uh, Bob McGowan had pock marks all over his face. And he hated anybody to mention his pock marks. So I was very diplomatic. He picked me up and I looked at him, stopped crying, stuck my finger in one of the pox marks and said, oh, what lovely dimples. <laughs> and I see, I got the job. <laughs> and I was on a three picture deal. And the first picture I supposedly had to go up with a goat in an elevator and I cried. I had to do, uh, at a table they had a Jack Horner pie or something that goes pop. And I cried, and I don't know what the third one was, but I cried and I was fired. And so I went back home to the hotel we were living in, and my mother was not very happy with me for about the next month. And then we got a telephone call from Hal Roach that he had bags and bags and bags of mail of fans that thought I was cute. And uh, he gave me a contract for five years. When I was watching the film today, I yeah. wondered what were your relations like with the other kids? I mean, did you, did you hang out with them? Did you no, like them? No, I was, no, they were all much older than I was. And uh, that sort of comes into education because Mrs. Carter, who was the teacher, you see, at that time when you were in movies, you, all the kids went to a professional children's school because in a professional children's school, they could let you out for interviews. They would, and uh, you would take your lessons with you and either do it as homework or if you got the job, then there was a teacher on the set. But Mrs. Carter, who was a teacher for the R Gang, thought I was too little and she wasn't gonna waste time teaching me. But uh, Joe Cobb, the fat one, and uh, Farina, the one, the dark boy with the rags in his hair, they took over my education. And I would stand between them. They were the chair. They had a, a bar at the bottom to hold the legs together. And I'd put one foot on one chair, on Farina's chair, and another foot on <coughs> Joe's chair. And they would give me, you know, two, two, two and two and four and four, and they would teach me how to write. Mm. And so actually, until I was, uh, well, six or seven, I think uh, Joe and uh, Farina educated me. That's how I got my beginning education. So, so you were good friends, you, oh, the kids together? Oh, just them. Just them too, yeah. And yeah. the one I liked best, the two people I liked best was uh, Joe Cobb's father, <coughs> who was a very nice man, and uh, Farina's mother, who was a very, very loving woman. They used to have contests all over the country for our gang kids. And one year it would be for a fat boy or another year it would be for me uh, or for uh, Farina or one of the kids. They would have, the, in all of the theaters, they'd have these uh, contests. And then the winner would go to Hollywood and they'd have a little bit part in the, uh, in the movie and stay for a week and then they'd all go home and that was the end of it. But one boy, the fat boy, chubby, Norman Chaney, he was taken in the gang and he was in the gang for a while. I'll tell you how long, eventually. But Norman's mother, where Joe Cobb was fat and his father kept him from eating chocolates or drinking Coke or having anything fattening because Joe had a, some kind of a uh, condition that he was fat and he, his father did his best to keep him from getting any fatter. Where Norman's mother stuffed him with potatoes and gravy and everything, candy bars and chocolate and uh, 
ice cream and everything that just make him fat. She was so afraid he'd get thin and lose the job. And he made a few pictures and then he went home. He goes, he grow tall and so he went home. And the sad part is that Chubby, Norman Cheney, died at 18 years old and he had made 18 pictures, one for every year of his life. And he died from a disease caused from his fat, whatever it was, he died from that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very sad, but that's what uh, many times did happen. Weezer was kept small because he smoked and drank uh, with his father's permission. But he was another sad, sad thing because uh, he died in 1941 in a plane crash as a cadet, in a plane crash, an Army uh, Air Force cadet. So he didn't have very long to live. But it's so sad, these things that uh, greed of the parents who have gone to Hollywood, the same as the X Factors today go on television. They went to Hollywood then to become stars. And when they didn't become stars, they became car hops, dressers in the theater, maybe makeup artists, something. And, uh, their kids were put in show business. And so they were, the children were making money and they were getting a vicarious thrill of, <clears throat> when we go to the, when we were called on stage, we were called on the set. We were not called. It was Mrs. Darling on the set with Jean, Mr. Cobb on the set with Joe. We were never so that these, the parents were the stars. We were merely the adjuncts. Well, having broken our hearts. Yes. Well, yes. Are you going to sing? What? You want me to sing? Well, to cheer us up a bit after those sad, sad stories. Should we do it about greengrocers? Sure. Street. It's run by a Greek. Now he sells very nice things to eat, but, but you should hear him speak. Whenever you ask him anything, he never answers no. He just yes, 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 yes is you to death. And when he takes your dough, he says, yes, we have no bananas. string beans and onions and cabbages and scallions and fresh fruit and, and we say we have old-fashioned tomatoes and egg oil and potatoes and yes we have no bananas we have no bananas today Donald, do you have any bananas? I have no bananas, no. bananas out there. Would you like to sing with me? Yes, we have no bananas. Come on, come on, come on, get going. You're sitting out there doing nothing. We're up here working. Honestly, you're sitting there loafing on the job. Now you gotta sing. Come on, all together now. Yes, we have no bananas.
think of another one to sing? Another one. Yeah. Well, I don't know. One is song that you can try to make sense of, but it doesn't make any sense, so we won't. Yes, you could do that, but what about down in the meadow, in the meadow, did he go away? And he said, he said, Mama, did he do? Did he say, Mama, did he say, you put ten and you came and you came right? No. <laughs> <laughs> were doing very well. They were trying very hard. So don't sack them all. Not but sack them no, all. No, all right, I'll all. take that one there in the pink shirt. She's okay. Okay. <laughs> and this boy he's here, okay. he did try. So yeah. he's okay. He can stay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think that's the first time we've done a request number, isn't it? <laughs> if there is, just give me the music, I'll sing it. <laughs> just because I don't know something. I mean, I don't know a lot of things. Uh, is there anything else you want to know? Uh, yes, how did you get on with Marianne Jackson, the, the plain girl in the... Uh... Well, Marianne was all right, but she drove me damn nuts. <laughs> Absolutely bonkers. Because all she did, all that girl did was play jacks. There she was with her little ball and the little things going bounce, 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 bounce. She made me sick. 
<laughs> Outside of that, she was all right. But she played jacks all the time, and I saw no point in jacks. So what did you do to amuse yourself if you didn't play jacks? <laughs> well, you'll probably laugh if I tell you. I read dictionaries. I embroidered. I, uh, they had a thing with a, a, a spool, and it had little na nails in it, and you, you sort of knitted on the spool, and you would pull the thing down. French knitting. Yeah, yeah. on a spool. And that's what I did, and I, I, read, I read altogether three dictionaries. <laughs> Don't, oh, well, I'll tell you why. I've, I've told this story before. You've asked if I had read dictionaries. Uh, well, I think it's why. When I was about seven years old, eight years old, I used to go out to MGM, and um, Eddie Mannix was, the, was one of the head honchos there. And his secretary was named Mrs. Partridge, and she had a beehole desk that was, and I'd sit under the, in the beehole of the desk and read Saks Romer's Fu Manchu's. <laughs> and uh, one day I'm sitting under there reading Fu Manchu. I like Fu Manchu because he had a little marmoset. And that's why I like Fu Manchu, because he had this little monkey and he lived in his sleeve. And these legs appear and uh, a hand comes down and fishes me out and takes the book out of my hand and is horrified because I'm seven, eight years old reading uh, Sax Romer. And he says, Miss Partridge, why do you let this child read this awful, mag this awful stuff? You know, you shouldn't let her read books like this. And she said, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Gable, but she does read these books. Well, it was Clark Gable and so he was <laughs> He went away, and a, f a few weeks later, I was back under the desk, and I was again reading Sachs Romer because I had a whole drawer full of them. And uh, he had the Blue Fairy book in his pocket. And in the block back of the Blue Fairy book, he had a pad and pencil. And he said, if you find a word that you do not understand, Mark the page, the line it's on, and, the, and how far in the word is, write the word down, look it up in the dictionary, then go back to the book, read it, so that you understand how it's used. And so I did that, and I thought, and I think that's probably why I became interested in reading dictionaries. <laughs> It had a lasting effect, because over the last year, uh, Miss Darling has written a, a, a quite long novel. Yes. Which, uh, I've begun to read, and it, it's a good read. Well, thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. Well, what else are you going to do, for heaven's sake? I mean, when you, when you get past 36, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I'm a heck of a way past that. <laughs>
what you should do is not clap me, clap him. <laughs> he is kind of, in a musical way, God's gift to me, because he's wonderful. And it's amazing. I mean, to think, you know, you didn't grow up probably watching Little Rascals as I did. But to see, to come, to have come here a few years ago and find that someone I watched on television and I listened to her beautiful voice on records, it's just, it's a miracle. You are a miracle. Oh, you are. Donald, I have told you a thousand times that you're only as good as your accompanist. <laughs> and your accompanist is only as good as the piano. <laughs> All right, but it's true. You're only as good a performer. Their entire performance can be destroyed if you don't have somebody like him. And there's only one of him in the whole world. Te 